So you've got a need, a need for mead. Well, here's how to build your own mead recipe. Mead is often argued to be the oldest alcoholic beverage on the planet. And it makes sense, right? If some bees have a hive inside of a hollow and rainwater gets in there, the yeast starts doing its thing, it's going to turn into mead on its own. And just imagine a prehistoric person coming across that, drinking that sweet fizzy water, and then realizing, hey, this, this is kind of nice. And you can make mead in your house a lot easier than finding an old tree stump full of fermented goo. Mead is full of cultural significance, from the Sumerians to the Vikings. There are plenty of old stories of mead being a part of everyday life. And so when a lot of people think of mead, they think about it wrapped up in this cultural significance. And particularly, they think about it as a higher ABV, very sweet, very boozy drink. And it can be that. But mead can also be a whole lot of other things. So in this video, we're going to talk about what mead is, all the integral components to make a mead, as well as mead styles and how to balance mead's various components so you get something super drinkable on the other end of fermentation. Obviously, mead is a drink, and so water is part of every mead recipe, even if it comes in the form of fruit juice. Water is crucial, and good water is really important. You want water with a nice mineral balance, not something that's, you know, distilled or reverse osmosis unless you're adding minerals back to it, because mineral balance is important to the drinkability of water. What I like to say is the best water for brewing with is the water that you would like to drink. And so if you have good well water or good filtered tap water, as long as it's got a nice mineral balance to it, it should be great for mead making. The other critical component of mead is honey. Honey is the sugar that the yeast will turn into alcohol in your mead. And honey can bring a lot of flavor. A clover or wildflower honey might just be kind of a neutral honey bear flavored honey. But you can also get fruit blossom honey like raspberry blossom, orange blossom, mango blossom honey that brings some of the character of the fruit tree to the honey. And in the case of things like orange blossom or lemon blossom honey, they bring some of that citrus zestiness with them too. There are also honeys like forest honey or buckwheat honey that bring a really dark, deep depth, almost a molasses character to your mead. Your honey varietal is a super important choice you'll be making as you're building your mead recipe. And then, like I mentioned, yeast is in there. A lot of people like to use wine yeasts or ale yeasts, and yeast themselves can bring a lot of intrigue to a mead. You can get a clean fermenting yeast like DV10 or D47 or EC1118, all wine yeasts, or you can get a really interesting yeast like a Belgian ale yeast that puts off a bunch of phenolics, or a Kvike yeast like Voss that puts in some of those orange marmalade flavors. Your yeast selection is also a super Super important choice that you'll have to make. And of course, yeast can't just eat sugar, they need their vitamins too, and that's why yeast nutrient is an important part of your decision-making process. You might choose diammonium phosphate, which is a very cheap and simple nutrient to use, but there are some constrictions on that because diammonium phosphate is really only good up to about 9% alcohol in your brew. So if you're making something that has maybe a potential of 15% alcohol by volume, your yeast are going to have trouble using diammonium phosphate phosphate after they hit 9% alcohol in your must. Fortunately, there are other options. Here at Craft Brew, we have our own nutrient blend, which is very similar to a nutrient called Fermade K, and we also have Fermade K and Fermade O. Both Fermade K and Fermade O are made for meads that can go into a higher alcohol by volume. Fermade K does have some of the inorganic nitrogen that you get from diammonium phosphate, whereas Fermade O is entirely organic nitrogen. And when I say organic and inorganic, I'm not talking about like when you go buy organic fruit at the grocery store. I'm talking about how the molecules are actually put together way down on the molecular level. And yeast can use different types of bonded nitrogen differently depending on how it is assimilable to the yeast. I know that all sounds really, really intense. 
Fortunately, out there on the internet, there are a wide variety of mead nutrient calculators that will do all of the thinking for you, and we'll put some links in the description to those. And then, while not an ingredient in your mead, sanitization is a super important process in making sure that you get the mead you want out of your ingredients, because sanitization helps ensure that the only microbe in your mead is the yeast that you put in there. And so a great sanitizer like Starsand, which is a no-rinse sanitizer, or the one-step sanitizer that we sell at Craft or Brew are great choices for making sure that you are getting as many of the microbes off of your gear and equipment as you can before your ingredients go in. And then lastly, also not ingredients, but also crucially important, is your fermentation gear. And here at Craft Brew, we have a variety of different fermentation kits, but what you really need is a bucket with a lid, an airlock, or a carboy with an airlock. And the latter is available in our mead making kit. Either your bucket or your carboy is your vessel that your mead is going to ferment inside of. And you want to make sure that those are also sanitized with your sanitizer. And you want to make sure that your seals are nice and tight so the carbon dioxide generated by fermentation goes out, but nothing bad like microbes or acetobacter or fruit flies can actually get in. And that's why we use a gasket or a grommet or a stomper with a water airlock because that ensures that your mead is safe throughout fermentation. There are a number of different styles of mead. Mead is probably the most versatile home-brewed beverage that there is, other than maybe kombucha. And so there are categories for mead styles, and we'll put some on the screen here for you. There's, of course, the traditional mead, which is just honey, water, and yeast. Melomels, which are fruited meads. And sizers, which are meads made with apples or sometimes pears. There's the methaglen, which is a spiced mead. A lot of people like to put cinnamon or nutmeg in those. There's the boche, which is mead made with honey that has been caramelized. And, of course, there's the piment, a mead made with grape juice or the Braggot, which is a mead-beer hybrid, or an Acer Glen, which is a mead made also with maple syrup. And the last one I'll mention, the Capsicumel, because it's one of my favorites. It is a mead made with peppers. Generally, it's made with one really hot pepper in the mix. And sometimes it's even made using fruit juice alongside the peppers and honey. There are a lot of mead styles out there, and so really do some research, look for some tested, trusted recipes before you build your own recipe to see what's working for others. So now you're ready to build your mead recipe. First off, choose your honey. What kind of flavor are you looking for? Are you looking for something zesty or fruity or neutral or deep and complex? You want to choose a honey that's going to marry well with whatever other ingredients you have in your mead. If you're making a traditional mead, the choice is pretty simple. You're going to taste some honeys and figure out which honey you want to ferment and then make a traditional honey, water, yeast, yeast nutrients. Super simple. But if you're making something like a melomel with fruit in there, what kind of honey might pair well with dark cherries or with guava or with starfruit? It's important to really kind of ferret out what you want from the final profile and try and choose a honey that's going to match with those. And again, search engines can be your friend. But generally, a big, dark, rich honey is going to go well with big, dark, rich fruits or with big, bold spices and herbs. But a lighter honey is generally going to go well on its own or paired with more delicate flavors. And then some honeys will surprise you. For example, raspberry blossom honey is one of my favorite honeys to caramelize. Just a short 15-minute caramelization and then add that in with some fruit whether it's raspberries or blackberries or strawberries, to give an enhanced layer of flavor and complexity to the honey that also matches really well with the fruit. Once you know the style of mead you want to make and the type of honey you want to use, you'll have a good idea of what direction you are headed as you build out the rest of your recipe. So once you've picked your honey and your style, you need to figure out what gravity you're going to target. Gravity is the measure of density in your must. And really what we're measuring gravity for is the density of sugars in our must. For example, one pound of honey for every gallon of mead is going to yield a lower alcohol, lighter, more refreshing mead. But up to maybe two and a half or three pounds of honey is going to lead to a bigger, more full-bodied, and stronger alcohol mead. And so in building your recipe, 
ABV is a big consideration because it dictates how much honey and therefore how much water you're going to need for that recipe. And again, we'll put some links in the description, but there's some great recipe building tools out there that will help you calculate these variables. Once you've settled on what you would like your ABV to be, say you would like it to be 15% alcohol, you need to then choose a yeast that can ferment that through to completion. And some yeasts, like ale yeasts, may not be able to get all the way up to 15%, but a lot of wine yeasts can. But again, you want to choose a yeast that is either going to complement or not interfere with the other ingredients in your brew. For a lot of folks, I like to recommend if you're building a mead recipe for the first time, pick a really nice neutral yeast so it's one less variable that you're having to work around. Scott Labs publishes a handbook about wine yeasts, and it goes into great detail on what kind of flavors they produce, what their nutrient requirements are, their ABV tolerance. It's a fantastic tool, and there will be a link in the description for that. So you've picked your style, you've picked your honey varietal, and you've maybe picked your other adjuncts, whether they're fruit or spices or something else, and you've chosen your yeast for your recipe. Now it's time to look at yeast nutrients. Again, the most popular ones are diammonium phosphate, Fermate K, or Fermate O, and of course, we sell a nutrient blend here at Craft Brew. And you want to make sure that the nutrients that you're using are providing enough vitamins, minerals, and particularly assimilable nitrogen so that your yeast can complete fermentation. And other than diammonium phosphate alone, the other popular yeast nutrients on the market should be able to help accomplish that. And make sure you use a nutrient calculator or a pre-calculated, pre-packaged quantity of nutrient to make sure that your yeast are getting everything they need. So a session mead is a mead that has a lower alcohol content, meaning you have less honey, meaning you have less work for the yeast to do. So generally folks will front load all of their nutrients into the mead right at the same time as they pitch their yeast. But for a higher alcohol by volume mead, something that's 12, 15, or 18% potential alcohol, a lot of folks like to stagger those mead nutrients over a few days. So that way you're spreading out the nutrient load and giving the yeast a more balanced diet. This helps to avoid temperature spikes that can create off flavors in the mead and generally just stress out your yeast. This method of adding nutrients is called staggered nutrient additions, and generally folks will do either three or four nutrient additions in this protocol. So however high the potential alcohol content of your mead will help dictate when you want to add nutrients. Lower alcohol mead, nutrients up front, higher alcohol meads, stagger those over the first few days. Finally, now that you've got your recipe all cobbled together, it's important to choose a fermentation vessel. If you're not using any adjuncts like spices or hops or fruit, it's pretty common to just ferment that in a one gallon carboy. But if you're using fruit or dry hopping or you're throwing a bunch of cinnamon sticks and nutmeg in there, you probably want to use a bucket and you probably want to use brewing bags to make it easy to pull those ingredients back out. Stuffing a bunch of fruit or spices into a carboy can make for a real pain later when you try and get those things back out of that very narrow neck in the carboy. I generally like to advise people to use a bucket for primary always and then transfer to a carboy, but there are definitely ways of making mead using a single vessel as long as you know that you might be limited to not using bulky adjunct ingredients. Building a mead recipe is not super complex. However, refining one can be. Sometimes I have brewed five, six, seven batches of a mead recipe until I get it dialed in just right. But that's the fun of homebrewing, experimentation, refining, and making something that's truly your own. Of course, we want to hear from you. What are your favorite mead recipes? And is there anything you think we missed in this recipe builder video? Drop a comment below and let us know. Make sure to hit that subscribe button below so you don't miss any future content from us here at Craft Brew. I'm BC for Craft Brew. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, I hope you've got good things brewing.